So welcome back everyone. So in today's video, we'll take a look at some more problems, starting with the problem from ideal gases. So in the question, we have a slender tube with both ends that are closed uh, and it contains an ideal gas with a total mass of capital M and one mole. The gas temperature is T and the gas constant is R. And the cross-sectional area of the tube is given to be A and from the and they're saying the from the ideal gas equation, it can be seen that the gas pressure at a certain point P can be proportional to the gas density at that point. Initially, when the tube rotates with a constant angular velocity of omega uh, in the horizontal plane with one end as the rotation axis, okay, and the direction along the axis of the tube is taken as the x-axis. Okay, and the axis of rotation is at x equals zero. Now, at this time, it's given that the gas pressure P of x and rho of x are also functions of x, and the gas pressure gradient at a point x is proportional to the density. So we have to find this factor beta. So that's the first problem. So a gas pressure gradient. So, okay, so so for this, what we'll do is at some distance of x from the axis, take an element of width delta x, let's say, and delta x is of course very small. Okay, and then let's say the pressure at the location x is p x, and at the location x plus delta x is p of x plus delta x. Okay, so okay, so if we consider the volume of gas present in this segment as our system, then so then the gas molecules from the right will push on this element towards the left and the gas molecules on the left will push the element towards the right. So if we just want to draw the FBD, okay, so now ultimately from the top view, this element is moving in a circle of radius approximately x, right? So we can say, so now we can just do a force balance. So on this element, so the net force towards the axis of rotation is the pressure from the right minus the pressure from the left multiplied with the cross-sectional area A. And this would be equal to the mass of the element. So we'll consider the density at location X as rho of X. And um, for the mass, we'll also multiply it with the volume of this element. So that would be A multiplied by delta X. So mass times the acceleration. So the acceleration is omega squared X. And yeah, so now this thing, so on the left side, we'll have delta P, right? And we'll take the delta X to this side cancel out the a's and we'll get this as rho omega squared x. So the factor beta is nothing but omega squared x. Okay, so, so beta is just omega squared x. Now the second question, we have to figure out the density variation. Okay, okay, so now, uh, so now we'll use the ideal gas equation and we'll use this variation of pm equals rho rt and here m is the molar mass okay and the molar mass is basically m itself because uh, the mass is m and the number of moles is one so and the mass of one mole of a gas is what is molar mass okay so uh, around the location x the pressure is p of x times the mass equals the density around the location x times rt okay so now if you just take the differential of this so we'll get dp of x times m equals equals d rho of x times rt by m okay so now we can just put it over here okay we can just write this as dp over dx itself so this would become rt by m times d rho of x so this is just dp uh, over dx okay so now we can just integrate this by separating the variables and we get rho of x equals rho naught e to the power m omega square x square over 2rt okay so so yeah so that's basically this question so the factor gamma will be just m omega square by 2rt so yeah that's basically it for this question it was quite straightforward okay so this is the next problem so we have two asteroids that are orbiting due to the force of gravity and assume that their masses are capital M and small m, capital M being much greater than small m. So if M orbits capital M in a perfect circle, the orbit period is 700 minutes and the orbit radius is 1000 meters. Okay. Now, if an object of mass M dash collides head on with small m, then what happens? Then what happens to the period is it becomes 690 minutes. And at this time, the semi-major axis A of the elliptical orbit. Okay. So after the collision, it starts moving in some elliptical orbit and uh, we have we have to figure out the semi-major axis of that elliptical orbit. So as the uh, time period ratios are given, we can just use Kepler's third law here. So, so T1 square over R1 cubed equals T2 square over R over A cubed. So T square is just proportional to the semi-major axis length cubed, right? So yeah, now we can just solve for A from here. The answer will turn out to be approximately 990.5 meters, okay? Now the second problem they're saying continuing from the previous question if the mass m dash is 500 kg the velocity is about so the velocity of the mass and the mass is given uh, and it is assumed that the collision process is a completely inelastic collision 
with no mass ejected from the asteroid, then the mass of the asteroid M equals. So we have to find the mass of this asteroid and uh, they've given us a general result. So if you have a mass that is orbiting in an elliptical orbit, then the velocity at any general r can be figured out using this formula. Okay, and if, and if you're wondering how did we get this formula, it's pretty simple. So the first information you need is this that the total energy of the asteroid in the elliptical orbit is negative gmm over 2a. So now we can just equate this to the total energy at some general r. So let's say the asteroid is somewhere over here and its velocity is let's say v. So the energy at this, at this moment is half mv squared kinetic energy and negative gmm over r which is the potential energy right so now you rearrange to figure out v and you'll get this formula so the idea here would be just that okay so the main idea here would obviously be momentum conservation right okay so first let's try to figure out the orbital velocity of the small m mass so let's say it's v naught so v naught is simply r naught multiplied by omega naught and omega naught is 2 pi over 700 okay because the initial time period was 700 multiplied with 60 to make it into seconds and we multiplied this with a thousand okay and this approximately becomes 0 0.1496 meter per second so we'll work with the assumption that the final velocity vector is in the vertical direction itself and now we'll just conserve momentum so finally okay and we can also figure out the final velocity using this particular result so let's say the final velocity is v prime okay so now uh, this factor of gm what we can do with that is so if you observe initially the mass m was orbiting the capital M mass in a circular orbit, right? So we can do force balancing here. So we can say GMM by R naught squared equals small m omega naught square R naught, right? So from here, the factor GM is just omega naught square times R naught cubed. So this is just V naught squared multiplied by R naught. Okay, so now we can use that result. So the final velocity is, so if we take the square root of GM, it so the V naught will come outside. And on the inside, we have R naught multiplied by 2 by R minus 1 by A. So the so the current R location is R naught itself. So this will also be R naught. So the inner term would become 2 R naught by A and the under root of this. Okay, so now we can substitute the values in. Okay, so this is the final velocity of the system. Okay, so now it's just momentum conservation. So initially, so the small m mass initially had a more velocity of V naught upwards capital M mass had a velocity of 6,600 meter per second. And we'll say the combined system, it moves up with a velocity of 0 0.14888 meter per second. So now it's just, so now we'll just conserve momentum in these two situations. And after solving the asteroid's mass turns out to be 4.6 times 10 to the nine kgs, okay? So this is like the first possibility and that is if the combined system is still moving in the same direction as the initial velocity vector v0. So in this situation, the mass turns out to be 4.6 times 10 to the power 9 kg. And 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 if in fact the mass small m is not that high, then the final velocity vector will be in the downward direction. So in that situation, we'll get a different value for the mass m. Okay, and that's around 1.1 times 10 to the power 7 kg. So it depends on the final velocity vector's direction. Okay, and so and if the mass is pretty high, then the direction remains the same. And if it's a bit low, which is of the order of 10 to the power 7, then the velocity vector will reverse its direction. So that's basically it for this question. Okay, so now the final question is from Pathfinder. So and this is from the magnetic effects chapter CYU10. So the question is we have a single layer conducting coil that is wound, uh, that is wound with no gap between adjacent turns on a cylindrical frame of radius r. So, and the diameter of cross-section of the wire used is uh, d. And d is significantly smaller compared to the radius of the cylinder. Now, it's given that the breaking stress of the material of the wire is sigma b, okay? At what magnitude of the current will the coil rupture, okay? So, that's a problem. So, now let's analyze it. Okay, so this is how the situation is kind of looking like. So, I'm not drawing the rest of the wires, but you guys get the idea, right? So the so then we send a current through it and and because of the current there will be a magnetic field uh, inside the volume of the cylinder which would resemble that of a long solenoid right so now now also there is no uh, separation between the wires okay 
so that's also something that we need to look at okay so first let's just say the current uh, that is flowing is i so because of this current i so if this is the cross-sectional view of the cylinder okay then the inward magnetic field will be will have a magnitude of first of mu naught n i okay where n is the number of turns per unit length so we'll figure out what that is after a while so first let's check out what's the phenomena happening here so first i'm considering a small section of uh, of the wire so let's say this angle is some delta theta so so of course we'll have our tension forces at the ends okay so now the thing is if this is the uh, this is the inside of the solenoid part so at the inside of the solenoid the magnetic field is mu naught ni so let's say the current is flowing in the clockwise sense so the mu naught ni will be inwards okay and right outside the magnetic field is approximately zero okay so now we are going to prove a fact that uh, the external magnetic field that is acting on this thin wire will have a magnitude that is average of the field just inside and just outside okay so in fact the field that is acting on this will be mu naught ni by 2 so that we can prove pretty easily so uh, for a second let's just neglect the curvature because it's a tiny uh, current element anyway so if we consider a point that is right below the current element and right above the current element to these points uh, the wire will look like an infinite wire because the points are just below and just above right so so here let's say this particular distance is some uh, x so the x distance is pretty small okay so the field right above will be in the outward direction we can use the formula for the infinite wire so it will be mu naught i by 2 pi x and right below it will be mu naught i by 2 pi x into the page okay so this is the field due to just this tiny wire element okay so now we'll use the rule of superposition Okay, so now let's say that uh, because of every other current elements, the magnetic field writes out right outside is some b, and the magnetic field right inside is also b. Okay, so this is so this is not considering this current element. Okay, so now if we superpose both of their effects, let's say, then we should get this particular situation over here, right? So so what that means is if we add so here b is in the outward direction so we can say mu naught i by 2 pi x minus b is equal to mu naught ni for the outside point um, for the outside point if you observe both of them are in the outward direction itself so we can say mu naught i by 2 pi x plus b will be equal to 0 okay so now what we can do is we can get rid of so we can say that mu naught i by 2 pi x is just minus b so we can write this as minus b so what we obtain is b which is the field external to the current element this is just equal to negative mu naught ni by 2 okay negative meaning it's in the opposite direction so the field is actually into the page okay so basically if we just take the current element the magnetic field that will be acting on it okay due to due to all current elements external to it will be this particular magnetic field which is which is the magnetic field of mu naught ni by 2 into the page so so in the most general case if um, if you guys want to figure it out in the most general case then it would be the sum it would be the average of the inside field and the outside field so if it's b1 inside and b2 outside so then the field acting on this would be b1 plus b2 by 2 so now because of this mu naught ni the force will be in the outward direction right so you can just do ideal cross b so it will be in the outward direction and the magnitude is i let's say the length is delta l and the magnetic field is mu naught ni by 2 okay so this is the force acting on this current element okay so now we can do the force balance now because of these two tension forces it will be um, for a small angle delta theta it will be t delta theta in the normal direction right and this would have to balance out the magnetic force delta theta now delta theta we can also write it as the length of the arc which is delta l divided by the radius of the cylinder mu naught n i square delta l by 2 okay so from here we get the tension force as mu naught n i square r divided by 2 okay so now as we have the tension so if let's say so this is let's say a tiny piece of the wire the diameter of the wire is given to be small d okay and the tensile force we figured out it was equal to t 
Okay, so the tension in the wire, so the stress in the wire, we can figure it out as the normal force acting divided by the cross section area, which is pi d square by 4. So now the thing is, we'll equate this to sigma limiting. So which is the stress at which the wire breaks. Okay, and the breaking stress was given to be sigma b. So this would be equal to this particular value. Okay. Okay, so now we need to just figure out the value of the number of turns per unit length and then we are done. So let so for that, let's go back to our cylinder. So let's consider a few elements over here. So the first thing here is guys, uh, these are like very close and there is no gap in between them. Okay, so let's say this is D and this is also D. So, okay, so now the thing is, let's say there are N wires, you know, in parallel, like this layer, let's say N wires. And these N wires are in a length of, let's say, delta L. So now, now N is just the number of turns in this particular length of delta L. Okay, so this is like one piece of the wire. And this pink color one is the second wire. The yellow colored one is the third wire. Okay, and so on and so forth. We have N wires. Now the diameter of one wire is D. So the wire diameter of N wires would be ND and ND would be equal to delta L. So we can say N into D would be equal to delta L. So from here, the number of turns per unit length is just one by D, right? So the number of turns per unit length is just one by D. So, so yeah, now basically we can just substitute it over here. So one over D would just means there would be a D cubed factor in the denominator. So the limiting current value, let's say I naught is this particular value. Okay, so yeah, that's basically it for this video, guys. If you have any doubts, you can ask below. And if you enjoyed, make sure to like, share and subscribe. And that's it. Thanks for watching.